HP Lion Tamer PT-14. In the weeks following Albus Dumbledore's departure, Hogwarts school deteriorated into little more than a battlefield. Almost the entire student body rose up against the new headmistress and her inquisitorial squad. Umbridge was at a complete loss as to how to reign in the uprising, as she was truly unable to catch anyone in wrongdoing. Explosions were the order of the day. Loud, earth-shaking booms were heard all throughout the day, except while students were sleeping, and even then an occasional thunder crack would awaken the castle. What was worse, at least for Umbridge, was the serious lack of support she had to help in controlling the student population. Teachers were turning blind eyes to any sort of shenanigans they happened upon, as it all seemed directed to making the new headmistress miserable. Two more students have resigned their posts upon the inquisitorial squad. If this keeps up, we shall have no help in keeping order within this school. Umbridge shouted during the weekly staff meeting. Up and down the table the professors all stared blankly at their headmistress, each of them filled with some disdain for the tiny fat woman. Save Filch, of course. The man practically worshipped Umbridge, especially since she had kept her promise and was now allowing whippings of students again. However, no one had been caught yet. Headmistress, as I've told you several times already, you are suffocating the students. McGonagall said flatly. If you would consider rescinding some of your rather constrictive rules, you might find that the rebellion ends on its own. Without rules, there is no order. Umbridge scowled. Yes, but too many rules and those who you are trying to bring to order will fight back. Professor Sprout said wisely. You are exacerbating the problem every time you introduce a new decree. Flitwick added. I do not need a lecture. What I need is for all of you to do your jobs. Or I shall be forced to have you all sacked. Umbridge tried to threaten them all, but they all smirked. Yes, that would be a very wise move. To remove us all with so little time left in the year, and have no one who could save you from the students. Flitwick grinned. I don't know if you realize, but the students outnumber us by a serious margin. How long do you think you'd last once it got out you fired Minerva, or Pomona, or Severus? No offense to you, Severus, but I do not think there would be too many students fussed over you getting sacked. Professor Sprout smiled. Snape merely looked bored. Umbridge stared at the teachers before her, her blood boiling in her veins. They were right, of course. She had very little time left in the year. There was no time to seek out new teachers to fill all the posts, and the students would most assuredly rise up as one even more than they were at the moment. Very well. The answer here is clear. We must make an example. It is obvious that these troublemakers are being led by someone. Someone with a serious grudge against the ministry. I believe we all know who that is. Umbridge scowl melted into a smile. Yes, we all know of your personal vendetta against the Potter brat. Snape spoke up, making all the other teachers look at him oddly. However, much as the boy of whores rules in general, he is no ring leader. But you forget, Severus, he was leading Dumbledore's little group. No, he was recruiting for the group, as you know full well. McGonagall reminded Umbridge of Dumbledore's words. Potter doesn't have enough brains in his head to lead, much less plan, some of the more impressive bits of magic that have been happening around us lately. Given what we've seen portable swamps, multiplying fireworks, not to mention the rise in sudden illnesses. Ah, yes, the cases of Umbridgeitis. Flitwick chuckled. I think it is clear that the true culprits are the Weasley twins. Snape sneered. Though you should be warned, those two boys are even more charismatic than Potter. McGonagall warned. Singling them out will be equivalent to declaring war on the student body. So what are you all telling me? To give up? 
to let chaos reign? I cannot do that. I will have order in my school. Umbridge screamed, stamping her foot, her fists balled tightly at her waist. The other teachers just looked at each other, some of them rolling their eyes in exasperation. Except Snape, who was watching the headmistress with cold calculating eyes. He recognized something in the woman. Something that chilled his cold black heart. Lust for power. He saw it whenever he had to gaze into the burning red eyes of his former master. He should have seen it sooner, from the time she arrived. Or even from the time she had tried to recruit him to her cause by promising that he would one day be allowed to teach the subject he so wanted. Snape was only now realizing what would become of the school should this obscene woman get her way. It would be like living in the world his former master sought for himself, only Pinker. This was not a future that Snape coveted. As much as he loathed Potter, he knew he had to protect him from Umbridge's clutches. He hoped by diverting Umbridge's attentions to the Weasley twins, the new headmistress might actually forget Harry long enough so the boy could sit his exams, and go home for the summer. They would have a few months then in which to figure out what they would do for the next year. Damn you, Albus, for abandoning us. Snape thought as Umbridge gathered her notes, dismissing the teachers. This isn't our bloody war. As the exams grew closer, the students within fifth and seventh years began studying harder than ever. However, it was believed that thanks to several of the new educational decrees, banning the use and practice of spells, no one felt they would perform all that well. They weren't even being allowed to use spells within classes anymore. For some, it was beginning to be too much. Harry awoke very late one evening after a rather disturbing dream in where Lord Voldemort was threatening one of his followers. It was one of the ones who'd been freed in the recent breakout of Azkaban that was blamed on Sirius. Harry was sure, especially since he had finished another very brutal session with Snape earlier in the evening, that the dream was real. Though it was clear that his mental defenses were trying to stop him from seeing any more. In the dream, Voldemort was wearing one of his Aunt Petunia most hideous dresses, and he and his follower were on the stage at Harry's primary school. Harry awoke with a start and decided that he was not going to get much more sleep. As the mental picture of the most notorious dark wizard in his aunt's clothes was the most disturbing thing he'd ever imagined. When he came down to the common room, he found Fred and George Weasley, along with Lee Jordan, hunkered over a small table in front of the fire. A bit late, isn't it, Harry? Fred asked. I was going to say the same to you, just what are you up to? Planning our escape. George said. Umbridge has been questioning more and more students lately, and it's only a matter of time before one of them gives us up. How are you even sure of what she's been asking students about? No one's been able to remember being questioned. Harry asked. That's cause she's obliviating them when she's done. If memory charms were easy to prove, that old toad would be tossed into Azkaban so fast it's make her fat head spin. Lee Jordan growled. Why are they hard to prove? Harry asked. Partially because the person has no recollection of having his memory modified. But if there are also no witnesses, there's no case. Only really talented mind healer could tell, and even then they wouldn't be certain. George explained. The mind's a really complicated thing. Fred nodded. So, you're convinced she's going to come after you instead of me? Harry asked a hint of a smile on his face. There was a lot of talk that Umbridge suspected Harry to be the one causing most of the disturbances about the school, even though every single time he was nowhere near the incidents. Bit of an ego there, mate. Fred winked. Yeah, you may be public enemy number one on Umbridge's list, but we all know who the real criminal masterminds in this school are. George smiled mischievously. I never ever doubt my place in the criminal hierarchy. 
Harry chuckled. So am I going to be allowed to know what you're planning? What do you think, Fred? I think that as our financial backer, Harry has more than proven himself. Fred grinned to his brother. All right, Harry, listen up. The twins' plans were put into effect upon the Friday before the start of the exams. It was lunchtime when a group of very old-looking witches and wizards appeared in the Great Hall, escorted by a smiling, and rather nervous-looking umbrage. Harry was staring across the Great Hall at Daphne, who looked just as upset as he was. No longer were students allowed to sit anywhere but at their own house tables. Harry only got to see Daphne during class now, and both of them were missing each other terribly. Harry was very jealous of Hermione and Neville, who got to spend loads of time together. Harry even felt a few twinges of bitterness at Ron, who was spending more time with Lavender Brown. You suppose she's nervous that something might explode, and the examiners will see how little control she has on the school? Neville asked, breaking Harry out of Daphne's spell. I think it's a certainty. Hermione nodded. I'm actually disappointed that Fred and George didn't have something planned. Who says they haven't? Harry smirked, remembering his late night meeting with the twins. What do you know? Hermione asked, her eyes bright with curiosity. Harry had to admit that his friend had changed a lot over the year. She was still a dedicated student, however, her love of rules and order had melted away a bit. Harry was sure having seen that she could become like their current headmistress had done much to humble the bookworm. I was sworn to secrecy. Sorry. Harry smiled, and Hermione shook her head. Both Ron and Neville grinned as Harry winked at them. The day progressed as any other with students grumbling as they walked between classes. Harry kept his eyes open for Daphne. They survived these days on quick touches as they passed in the halls. Harry had not had a decent amount of time with her since Dumbledore's exodus. The very next day Umbridge had issued several decrees forbidding houses to mix at meal times, and a very strange rule about boys and girls remaining at least eight inches apart. There were lots of rumors regarding this rule, most of which centered around Umbridge's own lack of romantic experience. It was at dinner that the Weasley twins' plot unfolded. Harry and his friends entered the Great Hall for dinner, as they usually did, and Hermione had been quizzing them on charms to help them review as they sat down. Harry noticed Umbridge looking rather pleased with herself as she spoke with the examiners. Harry guessed she was rather pleased that the school had been quiet over the last few hours. He thought she might be telling them how much better she was as headmistress than Dumbledore had been while he was in charge. Students began filling their plates and a general buzz begun as students began talking about whatever held their interests at that moment. Students of Hogwarts. Came a very loud voice which echoed off the high ceiling. Harry and the rest of the student body turned as one to the entrance to the Great Hall, where the Weasley twins stood tall and proud before them. We would like to direct your attention to the staff table where, the teachers and guests of Hogwarts School have kindly volunteered to demonstrate our latest Weasley Wizard Wheezes. Every head turned again to stare up at the staff table to gaze upon the rather hilarious faces of the staff. They all looked like frightened deer as the Weasleys began to approach. While they look perfectly normal for the moment, we secretly replaced their drinks with our newest and most outrageous new products. Fred said to the very attentive audience. First, our Weasley hair tonic. Gives the drinker a very luxurious mane of Weasley red hair. George smiled and gave a wave to the staff table. At that moment, every adult's hair began to chance in color to become flaming red, even brighter than any Weasley. Harry thought for sure that McGonagall at least would be severely angry, but the transfiguration teacher seemed rather impressed actually. She looked as if she was complimenting Professor Sprout on her new color. In fact, only Snape seemed upset, though Harry swore he saw the man's lip twitch once, though Harry was sure it had been a trick of his mind. 
Laughter began softly at first, as one by one each teacher's hair began to alter in color. Umbridge stood up at once, fury in her pouchy eyes, however, when she opened her mouth to speak, a loud croak issued forth. Umbridge's face turned crimson as the laughter became a roar. The squad teacher slapped her hands to her mouth, her eyes bulging with embarrassment. Oh, yes. Fred smiled triumphantly. The dialect liquor changes your victim's voice into a very realistic animal sound. Comes in toad, lion, elephant, gorilla, and... Filch came rushing into the great hall, holding his throat and braying loudly like a donkey. His stringy hair was also weasley red. Jackass. George finished. All of these items can be purchased at our new location in Diagon Alley. Fred smiled. There is a 50% discount to all Hogwarts students who intend to use our products to cause mayhem for the Great Pink Toad. George announced with a bow. More laughter erupted at the Slytherin table as known members of the Inquisitorial Squad's hair all turned brilliant shades of Weasley Red. Umbridge was pounding her fists on the staff table, and pointing to teachers to get up and take the Weasleys. All of the other teachers looked confused by her hand motions. Umbridge tried to yell her orders but only loud croaks came out, making the Great Hall erupt in more laughter. Finally, Umbridge took out her wand and aimed it at her throat. With a final loud croak, Umbridge somehow cancelled the effects of the spell on her voice. Almost. As she spoke, her false high girl speech was more of a deep toad-like croaking. You two have gone too far this time. She snarled her face burning red with embarrassment and anger. She aimed her wand at the two of them who stood before her proudly. Mr. Filch, I have your first two troublemakers. You will give them each twenty lashes, before making them assist you in cleaning up the defacement on the third, fifth, and sixth floors. I will be most pleased to see those swamps taken care of at last. Sorry to disappoint you. George smiled. Yeah. You see, we've had all we can stomach of you and your decrees. Fred chuckled. So, we decided to throw ourselves a going away party, and you were the entertainment. To the rest of the staff, don't worry, the effects will wear off in an hour. The headmistress, however, will have that frog in her throat, and the gorgeous new hair for quite some time. Fred grinned. We gave her a special dose. George chuckled. Croak. Stay where you are. Umbridge shouted as Fred and George began backing out of the Great Hall. Sorry, but we've got a schedule to keep. Fred waved. At that moment, two brooms came soaring into the Great Hall from the ceiling windows that the post owls usually used. Harry noticed something else as well. Peeves the poltergeist was slowly rising up behind Umbridge with a trumpet to his lips. Stop. Croak. Someone stop them. Play us off, Peeves. George said as he mounted his broom. It sounded like a foghorn blast. Loud and very rude sounding, and it was right in the headmistress' ear. Umbridge looked as if she'd been knocked over the head with the elephant-sized blood G-E-O-R. Cheers rang up from the students as Fred and George did a victory lap about the Great Hall, before hovering in front of the staff table and saluting the teachers. Professor Snape, we feel we should thank you most of all. Fred said. You were a right kid, but your class proved to be the most beneficial to us. George smiled. To Professor Severus Snape. The Great Hall broke into applause, and Snape looked mixed between pleased and murderous. Harry was sure he'd never been celebrated in his entire life and was unsure what he should be doing. The twin snapped off a very respectful salute, to which Snape barely inclined his head, and the Weasley twin soared out of the castle and into Hogwarts legend forever. For the rest of the weekend, no one saw nor heard from Professor Umbridge. She had locked herself away in her private quarters, 
presumably to try and fix what the twins had done to her. Fortunately, the images would never disappear, as Colin Creevy had managed to snap a few amazing shots of Umbridge with flaming red hair. I only wish it had sound. He said showing Harry and his friends Sunday morning. I doubt that will ever be forgotten. Neville smiled. I wonder what color hair someone would get if they already had red hair. Hermione puzzled aloud. The all exams started Monday morning and were scheduled to be spread out over the course of the next two weeks. They would sit for an exam on one day, and then get the next day off to review for the next subject. As Monday was scheduled to be for Transfiguration, Harry, Hermione, Ron, and Neville were all poring over five years of notes and quizzing each other diligently about the exam. Other fifth years joined them and soon all the Gryffindor fifth years were studying hard together with one goal, to make Professor McGonagall proud. On Monday morning, just after breakfast, all the fifth years were excused to the entrance hall while the Great Hall was prepared for the exams. Daphne and Tracy caught up with their friends while they were waiting. Are you ready for this? Tracy asked. Daphne stood as close to Harry as she could under Professor Umbridge's watchful eye. The toad had finally appeared that morning with her disgustingly sweet girl a voice returned at last, though her hair had a distinct pinkish hue now. I have missed you so much. She said earnestly. She wanted desperately to have his arms around her, but she didn't dare while Umbridge was watching. Several sixth-year students had been expelled for breaking that particular rule. Daphne had heard a rumor that they were Muggleborns and that a few pure-blood students caught doing the same thing got off with detention only. Given that Harry was high on Umbridge's list, Daphne didn't want to be the reason he got expelled. I've missed you, too. But I think we'll make up for it all over the summer. Harry smiled genuinely. They had been talking about arranging visits during the summer holidays, and Harry had even promised to take Daphne into the muggle world for a movie like regular teenagers. After Harry had explained the concept, Daphne had gotten excited. She had once seen muggle television and had enjoyed it immensely. This promised to be even better. The great hall opened, and the students filed in. The four house tables were gone and individual desks were now arranged in four long rows. Everyone got a seat and the examiners introduced themselves. They explained how the written portions of the exams would work and then handed out the tests. Harry had never been so glad for Hermione being his friend. Thanks to her insistence that they all review, Harry found that he had very little trouble with this part of the exam. He had a few points where he really had to rack his brain, but when time was called, Harry felt very strongly about his results. Harry, Daphne, and the rest of Harry's friends headed out onto the grounds in the hour they had before lunch. Harry hoped he might get a chance to steal away with Daphne and make up for so much lost time. However, wherever they went, Draco Malfoy and his goons followed at a distance. I bet he's hoping you guys do something he can report to Umbridge. Tracy glared over her shoulder as the group climbed up on a large boulder near the Black Lake. Or, he's hoping to get a few pointers. Daphne quipped. I think Tracy is closer. Hermione growled. He's been following me around like a lost dog for weeks. Harry scowled. He's been like my personal shadow. You should thank him. Ron smiled. Everyone looked at him as if he'd suddenly lost his mind. Thank him. What the hell for? Harry asked. Think about it. Every time there's been anything dodgy going on around here, he's been a witness that you weren't involved. Actually, that's right. Daphne smiled, catching on. He's been your personal alibi. I guess the polite thing then would be to thank him. Harry grinned, knowing how it would grate on the blonde Slytherin that he'd been helping Harry all this time. Oh, Harry, don't go provoking him now. Hermione whined as Harry climbed down from the boulder. 
the rest of his friends following him. I'm not provoking him, Hermione. I'm simply going to thank him for watching my back. Oi. Malfoy. Malfoy turned his head and glared at Harry as he approached. What do you want, Potter? I wanted to thank you for watching over me these past few weeks. If you hadn't, I'd probably have been kicked out of here. Harry smiled. What are you on about? Draco asked, obviously confused. Well, if you hadn't been so diligent in watching my every move, Umbridge might have not believed I wasn't responsible for all the chaos around here. You've been a really great friend to me, and I just wanted to thank you. Draco's pale face suddenly burned crimson with rage. I thought we were trying to get him kicked out. Theodore not asked with surprise. Is that why we've been following him all this time? To protect him. Wasn't it? Harry asked in mock surprise. No you idiot. Malfoy snapped. But he just said. Doyle grunted. He's messing with us. Draco snarled. Wait a minute. Harry looked puzzled. You weren't trying to be my friend. I would never lower myself to be your friend, Potter. I'd rather. Get caught snogging Umbridge. Neville asked. Polishing your wand while looking at pictures of Lockhart. Tracy suggested. Have Moodblood Lover tattooed on your chest. Daphne grinned. Or was it your bum? Now, come on you guys. Harry said, his eyes intent on Draco's cold grey ones. We all know his greatest ambition is to lick the boots of the powerful. His father's been teaching him however since he was a baby. It's a Malfoy family tradition to lick boots, isn't it, Draco? How dare you? Draco hissed, groping in his cloak for his wand. I'll show you who licks boots. Now, now, Draco, you know we're not allowed to use magic. Tracy scolded. Whatever would the High Inquisitor think if one of her own squad broke the rules? Daphne asked, feigning horror. And the captain, no less. Tracy looked pitifully at Draco, shaking her head. Draco seemed to be thinking hard about what was said. He stared hard into Harry's eyes weighing his options. Sure, the headmistress was on his side, but would she have his back with so many witnesses? And Potter hadn't even pulled his wand. He knew he'd have a better chance if Potter were wielding his wand as well. Erring on the side of caution, Draco put his wand away. One day, Potter, you and I are going to settle things once and for all. Draco said menacingly. Draco, I eagerly await that day. Harry said fondly. Draco turned and walked away his goons following, hounding their leader with questions, and looking over their shoulders at Harry and his friends. That was. Ron began looking thoroughly delighted. Brilliant. You shouldn't have said those things, Harry. Hermione chided. Because they were mean, or because they were true. Harry smiled, and Hermione had a very difficult time keeping her face stoic. Come on, let's eat. We're going to need the energy for this afternoon. The next two weeks passed in a haze of exams, and Harry found himself losing sleep as he and his friends spent as much time as they could reviewing. The written portions had been fairly easy due to the immense amount of time they reviewed, but the practical portions had been more difficult. Given they had been unable to practice magic within the school. As a result, more and more students were becoming frustrated with their performances, and having more difficulty in performing magic when the time came. It was looking as if Umbridge's philosophy about understanding the theory being enough to get them through was a load of dragon dung. The only consolation was that the examiners were aware of Umbridge's ban on magic performance, and seemed genuinely sympathetic. The bright spot for a select few had been on the defense against the dark arts practical, 
in which those who had been part of the dub performed brilliantly. Harry received many claps on the back and thank yous from his fellow dub members when they finished their practicals. As well as studying for exams, Harry was still meeting with Snape for acclumency lessons, which had progressed to Harry not being allowed his wand during their sessions. Harry had little difficulty in seeking out Snape's presence which had become increasingly more subtle. However, without his wand, it was very troublesome getting the great black git out of his head. By the last day of exams, Harry was a wreck. The night before he had had his most tiring session with Snape yet, and his lack of sleep over the two weeks was catching up with him at last. Thankfully, the last exam was for history of magic, and there would be no practical exam that afternoon. Harry sat down and prepared to take his final exam along with the other fifth years, looking forward to a well-deserved rest. There was only one week of school left, and all fifth years would not be doing any work. In fact, Professor Flitwick had promised that they would be having a party in his class. You may begin. The examiner called out, and as they had done for the past two weeks, the students bent over their parchment and began answering questions. Once again, Harry was thankful that Hermione was so insistent on reviewing for everything, while at the same time, he began feeling a dull thud inside his skull. As tired as he was, Harry had a great deal of trouble focusing on his exam. During the Goblin Rebellion of 1450, who led the Goblin Army against the Wizards of York, Harry read the question. He took a breath trying to think of the name of the Goblin General, when the face of his godfather appeared in his mind for a brief moment. Harry shook his head to clear it. He had missed Sirius, but had been unable to speak to him since the mirror was now shattered. He didn't dare write as mail was being surged, and he couldn't use the flu as the were all being monitored. He knew that he'd be seeing his godfather soon, but he needed to focus on the exam. Get it for me. It was a whisper, a cold hissing whisper. Harry looked up from his parchment to look around him. Had someone spoken to him? The dull dust in his head was becoming more insistent. Harry shook his head again, trying to clear it. I'm tired. That's all. Finish this and you can take a nap or something. Harry told himself. Serious face flashed in his mind again. He wasn't smiling at all. He was staring defiantly up at someone. He looked as if he'd been beaten up. He's fine. You're tired, and you're imagining things. Harry said firmly. Focus now. He began to feel a prickle in his scar as the pounding in his head reached a fervent pitch. Harry gripped the sides of his desk tightly, breathing hard, and beginning to sweat. What is happening to me? Harry wondered, looking around at all the other students who were intently focused on their tests. You will do as I command, Black. You will retrieve the prophecy, or you will die, the voice said in an almost loving intonation. Sinister, pale fingers reached out to wipe at the blood on Sirius' forehead. Sirius recoiled, and spit at the hand. You've wasted your time in bringing me to the Hall of Prophecies. I will never do your biting. We shall see. Crucio. Harry's scar burst with intense blinding pain, and he heard Sirius cries in his mind. All around Sirius, Harry saw sparkling points of light, and many, many shelves. Sirius writhed and squirmed upon the obsidian floor at the feet of his captor. Retrieve the prophecy, Black. You know its location. Row 95. Retrieve it for Lord Voldemort, and you shall be free. No. Harry screamed with his godfather and fell out of his seat, clutching at his head. He felt hands grabbing him, trying to calm him. Harry. It was Daphne's voice. He heard Hermione and Neville as well. Back to your seats. A stern voice said. 
Slowly the pain rescinded and Harry's mind cleared. Are you all right, young man? Harry's vision cleared and he could see the head examiner staring at him with concern. I'm I'm okay. I think. All right, then. This happens every year. Someone always has a bit of a breakdown. A bit of water and a few breaths of fresh air, and you'll be fine. But, it will have to wait. You still have time to finish your exam. No. Harry said quickly. No, I mean, I think I've done all I could. Thank you. Harry said getting to his feet. He could see Daphne standing just behind the examiner. Very well, then. Off you get. I'm finished, too. Daphne said following Harry out of the great hall. What happened? She asked as soon as they were outside. Voldemort. Harry said gravely. He's got serious. You're sure of what you saw? Hermione asked. She, Neville, Ron and Tracy had finished their exams and found Harry and Daphne outside waiting for them. I mean, you're supposed to be able to protect your mind. Yes, but between exams, and Snape's new training regime, I'm exhausted. The last time I saw something was at Christmas, when I was really tired, remember? Harry reminded her. But Harry, the Hall of Prophecies is deep within the Ministry. My Uncle Algy is an unspeakable in the Department of Mysteries, and that's where the Hall of Prophecies is located. Neville said. How would Voldemort and Sirius get in there without being seen? Polyjuice. Disillusionment. Invisibility cloaks. Harry responded. He looked truly frightened, and Daphne took his hand, making him look into her eyes. Does it really matter? It's Voldemort for Merlin's sake. What you're suggesting is crazy, Harry. Going to the ministry? I mean, how would we even get there? Ron asked, looking halfway convinced and fearful. We fly. We get brooms and we fly there. Harry said quickly. Harry, it's not that I don't believe you, but this seems. Hermione began. Like some kind of trap. Tracy suggested, looking at them all in turn. Fine. Harry said angrily. I'll go by myself. He began walking back to the castle to get his broom when Daphne suddenly stepped in front of him. Hold on just a minute. Daphne said, putting her hand on his chest, and being surprised to feel his heart hammering within it. You're not going to fly off to London on your own without help. We're with you. She's right, mate. Ron said firmly, crossing his arms. There is no way you're going without us. We just need to be smart. We need to make sure it's not some silly trap. Hermione said wisely. And how do we do that? Harry looked restrained. He wanted to be moving, to go and rescue his godfather. Why couldn't they understand the severity of the situation? We contact Sirius. Hermione said. How? The mirror was smashed, remember? Harry scowled. I know. Hermione said ignoring the venom in Harry's voice. That's why we're going to use the flu. Okay, are you all right? Ron asked. All the flus are being monitored. Not the flu in Umbridge's office. Hermione smiled. She's gone mental. Ron said as he stared at Hermione's Cheshire-like grin. She's not going to just let us make a call. We'll have to distract her long enough for Harry to get in and make the call. If it turns out that Sirius is indeed missing, then we can figure out what we should do then. For right now, let's just make sure that this isn't a trap to get Harry. Harry mulled it over. It made sense. If it turned out that Sirius was alright, then there was no need to go off half-cocked. 
however, Harry had rarely ever seen something through Voldemort's eyes that wasn't true. Was it possible that Voldemort now knew of their connection, and Harry wasn't strong enough to keep him out of his mind? Snape had told him often how terribly powerful the Dark Lord was supposed to be. Yet, he'd not had any nightmares of visions except when he was truly worn down. And if old Snakeface really was aware of their connection, why show him what was happening? Did he know Dumbledore wasn't around? It was all too confusing to think about for the moment, and every second he wasted, was a second that Sirius got closer to death. He needed to get moving. Harry took several calming breaths before turning to Hermione. All right. What do you have in mind? Excuse me, Professor, but some of the Inquisitorial squad caught a few students setting up another portable swamp in the Transfiguration Corridor. Tracy said, looking concerned. They asked me to come get you right away. Did they? Umbridge asked looking delighted. Who was it? I'm not sure, but I think it was Weasley. Tracy said, shrugging her shoulders. Aha! Umbridge said with glee as she picked up her wand. Another Weasley out of this school. Take me to them. Tracy turned and lead the headmistress away from her office. As soon as they had turned a corner, Harry and Daphne emerged from under Harry's invisibility cloak and slipped inside the headmistress' office. We have to hurry. Daphne said. Once she figures out that there's no swamp, she's going to come right back. She whipped out her wand and aimed at the fireplace. Incendio. Neville and Hermione should be able to give us plenty of warning. Harry said as he went to the mantel and grabbed a pinch of fluff powder and immediately tossed it into the flames. He got on his hands and knees and slowly put his head in the green flames. Number 12, Grim Old Place. Harry blinked his eyes and found himself staring into the kitchen of his godfather's home. Hello. He shouted. Serious. He was met with only silence. Harry called out several more times, but no one answered. Come on, anyone. Harry said getting increasingly worried. His heartbeat raced in his chest and a cold chill crept up his spine. Could it all be true? Did Voldemort have his godfather? Serious. Finally Harry heard a low wheeze and a slow shuffle. Harry craned his neck as best he could until he saw Critcher, Sirius house elf. The decrepit beast was carrying a basket full of trinkets that he had obviously pilfered from throughout the house, trying to save them from the purge. Critcher. Where is Sirius? Harry asked, panic in his voice. Master Sirius is not here. Critcher said in a slow wheeze. Master Sirius was fed up with Albus Dumbledore's insistence that he remain hidden. Master Sirius has been gone a very, very long time. Critcher only hopes nothing bad has befallen his master. Critcher was smiling as he spoke, and Harry remembered that Critcher had been missing for a long time during the Christmas holiday. Was it possible that Critcher had sought out Death Eaters and told them any secrets he might have overheard? Critcher, you'd better tell me where he is. Critcher has no idea where his master has been taken. Taken? What do you mean taken? Critcher shuffled off, chuckling to himself and muttering about what could be happening to his master. Harry started to call him back when he felt himself being pulled out of the fireplace. Harry stumbled and fell on his hind end to find himself looking up at a very delighted looking Professor Umbridge. I knew warding my office was a good idea. And using Miss Davis to try and lure me away do you think I'm stupid? Harry glanced around and saw that Tracy was slumped in a chair, obviously having been stunned. Draco Malfoy and several other inquisitorial squad members were there, each holding on to one of Harry's friends. All their wands were in Umbridge's fat little hand. I finally got you, Mr. Potter. Dumbledore isn't here to protect you. 
I am going to ask you questions, and you are going to give me answers. You are going to tell the truth, or you will pay the consequences. Consequences? Like what? You'll make me write lines in my own blood. Harry asked incredulously getting to his feet. He had no time to waste on this waste of skin. Sirius needed him, and no one was going to stand in his way of helping his godfather. I've tolerated your outbursts and your lies all year, boy. The world thinks you're something special, but I know better. I know the truth. You are nothing more than a lying, no good, attention-seeking mentally unbalanced murderer. You've sought to sow sedition, and conspired against the government but you've finally been caught. You were trying to contact Dumbledore, weren't you? Answer me you little liar. What the in Merlin's name is going on here? It was Professor McGonagall. She was looking around at the inquisitorial squad members holding students at one point, and Umbridge staring coldly at Harry. I was just informed you were marching students into your office. What have they done? Professor. He's got pad food. Harry shouted as he suddenly realized the McGonagall could get word to help his godfather, she must know how to contact Dumbledore. Pad food? What is pad food? Professor McGonagall, you had better tell me what is going on if you know what's good for you. Umbridge said threateningly. Dolores, I suggest you tell your goon squad to let these children go before you get yourself into serious trouble. My gods, Miss Granger is turning blue. The minister won't be able to. Enough. I want answers now. Umbridge shouted. Tell me what is pad food, and where Albus Dumbledore is hiding this instant, or I will have you arrested for treason. Treason. McGonagall looked astonished. Have you lost your mind? Do not think me a fool. I know that you and the other teachers have conspired against me. That's why these brats have gotten away with all the trouble they've caused. You've protected this boy, but you can't help him anymore. I caught him sneaking in here to use the flu to contact Dumbledore. Now where is he hiding? Umbridge turned her wand on McGonagall, who had not drawn her own wand. I am going to give you one final chance Minerva. Umbridge said coldly. Make things easy on yourself. Do your worst. McGonagall said, her tone turning to ice in an instant. With reflexes that astonished Harry and every other student in the small office, McGonagall whipped out her wand just as Umbridge sent a stunning spell in her direction. The two women exchanged a volley of spells while the teens all took refuge behind the desk. Harry and Hermione pulled an unconscious Tracy to the floor with them. Don't get any ideas Potter. Draco said, shoving his wand up under Harry's chin. Harry took a quick look around, they were outnumbered and unarmed. This only served to make Harry angrier. To be at Draco's mercy was simply unacceptable. I'll give you one chance Malfoy. Harry said menacingly. You can back off and let us go, or we can make you and your friends regret ever joining the Toad. Do you really think you can beat all of us? Draco laughed. You don't even have your wands. Harry didn't bother with an answer. He clasped his hands together and brought them up as hard and fast as he could right into Draco's jaw. Harry heard and felt a very satisfying crack as Draco stumbled backward. To his right, Neville tackled Crab, who was easily twice Neville's girth to the ground, knocking away Crab's wand. The two began a mad scramble for the wand, while Hermione and Pansy began struggling. For the next few minutes it was pure bedlam as Harry and his friends struggled against their captors. Harry only had eyes for Malfoy. After knocking the blonde slime ball back, Harry lunged forward tackling Draco to the floor where he proceeded to wrestle his opponent into submission using an old reliable hold Dudley had often employed against Harry. 
Harry got hold of Malfoy's wrist and managed to pull the blonde boy's arm up and behind his back until it would go no further. Draco screamed in agony. He couldn't get a clear shot with his wand as Harry now had him face down on the ground, pinned to the floor. Let him go Potter. Harry turned to see Theodore not with his wand aimed at Daphne's face. He had apparently been able to bind Harry's girlfriend in ropes. Hermione was on the floor, with Pansy sitting on top of her, wand aimed directly between her eyes. Hermione had blood trickling from her split lip. Ron was being held against the wall by two very large slytherins, that Harry was sure were the seventh years. He looked as if both of the bigger boys had punched him in the gut and winded him. Both Crabbe and Goyle had managed to subdue Neville, who hadn't yet given up struggling. The three other inquisitorial squad members all had their wands trained on Harry as well. From outside there was a shriek of pain. Everyone turned at the sound. Harry took advantage and managed to get Draco's wand away from his rival, and sent a stunner at Knot, knocking the boy head over heels across Umbridge's desk. Unfortunately, that had gotten everyone's attention, and Harry wasn't hit by two stunners. He'd been focused on the three people in front of him, and was stunned by Parkinson, and one of the big seventh years. Wake up, Mr. Potter. Harry opened his eyes to see a triumphant-looking Umbridge staring down at him. Her hair was quite messy and there was a cut on her cheek, but she was smiling just the same. It unnerved Red him somewhat. He had no idea how much time had passed since he'd been stunned, though he guessed it hadn't been too long. We still have things to discuss. Umbridge smiled. What happened to Professor McGonagall? Harry asked angrily, still feeling a bit groggy. Umbridge allowed him to sit up, and Harry saw his friend still being held back. Hermione had been stood up, and not had been revived, though he still looked slightly loopy. Not to worry, she will be fine in time. She forced my hand, you see. I didn't want to have to do it, but she gave me no choice. What did you do to her? Harry asked. It is none of your concern at the moment. Now. I am going to ask you a question. Answer it, and it will make things much easier. Choose not to, and I will have to punish you. What is pad food? Piss off. Harry spat. Umbridge didn't even bat an eye. She lowered her wand at him and with a simpering sweet smile said. Crucio. Every nerve in his body felt as if it were on fire. His muscles contracted so hard that Harry thought he might break in half. He couldn't control himself. His body writhed and squirmed upon the floor as Harry felt he was being torn apart one tiny molecule at a time. Stop it. Leave him alone. He doesn't he know anything. Harry had the screams of protest from his friends from somewhere far away and then the curse lifted. Harry took several gasping breaths as his body relaxed and the pain ebbed away slightly. I'll tell you. Umbridge turned to look at someone Harry couldn't see. He closed his eyes trying to clear his head. He had to get out of there. Sirius needed him. I'll tell you why Harry was trying to contact Dumbledore. We finished it, and we needed to know what to do with it. With what? Umbridge asked, that disgusting smile still on her face. The weapon. The one we've been building for Dumbledore. Harry recognized the voice as belonging to Hermione. He had no idea what she was talking about, and frankly he didn't care. He'd simply had enough. Anger surged through him like he'd never felt in his life. She'd tortured him, she'd harassed him. Everything bad that had happened to him that year was at her hands, and he'd taken it all. No. Harry shouted as he kicked both of his legs out, striking the fat woman just above her knee. There was a loud crack and Umbridge howled in agony. Harry rolled himself up and knocked the toad onto her back, 
snatching her wand away and snapping it before tossing the pieces into the fire. You broke my leg you insolent brat you'll pay for this. I'm going to see you kissed by the Dementors. I should have sent more of them after you last summer. I should have sent a hundred of them to do the job right. Umbridge shouted at Harry who had already launched himself across the desk and knocked both Crab and Goyle away from Neville. Ron had not waited and kicked the legs out from under one of the gorillas that had been holding him. Neville lunged for Umbridge's desk where their wands lay, and snatched up the first one he could reach, spinning on his heel and stunning not for the second time. Hermione shoved her elbow right into Pansy's gut, and also went for a wand. Ron broke the nose of his second captor, and shoved the large teen away before stomping on the hand of the second boy, who was trying to get to his feet. Neville stunned both Crab and Goyle, before turning to Pansy, who Hermione had shoved onto the floor. In a few more minutes, all of the inquisitorial squad was stunned and bound on the floor. Tracy was being revived by Daphne, who Harry had freed from her bonds. Harry was now standing over Umbridge who was still on the floor holding her damaged leg. He held the wands of the inquisitorial squad in his hand as he stared at the woman who'd made his life so miserable for so long. You sent the Dementors after me? He asked, his wand now aimed right at the toad. Just what was it you hoped to accomplish? I had to do something. I had to silence you. You were threatening the government and no one was doing anything. I had to shut that filthy lying mouth of yours once and for all. Stupefy. It had been Daphne who stunned the headmistress. Harry turned to look at her face, eyes full of tears. She lowered her wand slowly as she looked up at him. Harry could see clearly that she was shaking badly. She's lucky she only got stunned. Daphne said her voice full of bitterness. I, I just couldn't stand watching her do that to you. Harry enveloped her in his arms and held her tightly for a moment. How did she get all of you? Harry asked. She didn't buy my story at all. Tracy said still sitting down. As soon as we were out of the corridor she stunned me. Malfoy and the rest of these losers came and got us. Neville said resisting the urge to kick Malfoy. Did you talk to Sirius? Ron asked. No. He's gone. Critcher said he'd left and mentioned he was caught. It was real. My vision was real. Then we should get moving. Tracy said, getting to her feet. What happened to McGonagall? Harry asked. The group left the headmistress' office and found McGonagall lying on the floor, unconscious. Hermione reached her first. She checked for a pulse first, and sighed when she felt it. She's alive. Ron quickly left the defense class and grabbed the first student he found and sent them for Madame Pomfret. We need to get to the ministry. Harry said. As fast as possible. We also need a few things from the room of requirement. Neville said. Your invisibility cloak would be good to have along as well. He's right. Harry, you get up to Grapender Tower and get your broom and invisibility cloak. The rest of us will got to the room of requirement. We'll met at the front gates in 15 minutes. Harry was impressed at Ron's sudden take charge attitude. The redhead didn't even wait for Harry to confirm that he understood before he was leading the group out of the defense classroom. Harry raced up the stairs and into Grapender Tower. He realized that he still had the wands of Malfoy and the rest of Umbridge's henchmen in his hand. Might be good to keep these a bit longer. Harry thought. He threw open his trunk's lid and pulled out his invisibility cloak and his broom. He also grabbed the sword given to him by his godfather, shrinking it down and stuffing it in his pocket. As he ran back down towards the gates, it occurred to him that he was the only one with a fast broom. How were they all going to get to London? Harry was the first one down to the gates. 
he watched as his friends emerged from the castle, running towards him. Not a single one of them was carrying a broomstick. We have a problem. Harry said, holding up his broom. Neville already thought of that. Don't you remember Hagrid's lessons? Hermione smiled proudly at her boyfriend. Harry arched an eyebrow, looking confused. How are flobberworms going to get us to? Festrals. Daphne said, patting his cheek and walking past him towards the forbidden forest. All we gotta do is tell them where we want to go, and they'll get us there. Neville grinned. Hagrid said they have an amazing sense of direction. Hagrid's lesson came back to him as the black skeletal horse he'd been seeing since his return to the school was finally explained. The Thestrals were attracted to the scent of blood, as they liked fresh meat. Before Harry could ask how they were going to go about getting the Thestrals' attentions, he saw Ron running his hand along one of the swords from the Room of Requirement. He then noticed all of his friends carrying swords. Thought it'd be a good idea. Neville said, answering his unasked question. Thinking ahead. Good. So was I. Harry smiled holding up his fistful of wands. Back up wands. Not bad, mate. Ron grinned taking on and testing it with a flourish. You guys need to pay attention, because none of the rest of us can see these things. Daphne reminded Harry and Neville. Both boys looked up and saw that indeed two of the spectral-looking beasts were emerging from the wood. Harry went to the closest and allowed it to sniff him. Harry wondered if this was the same Thestrals he'd seen a few times before, as it nudged him playfully, snorting hard. I'll help you up. Harry said to Daphne. It was a very strange sight to see Daphne floating in the air. Neville helped Hermione onto the next Thestral, and as a few more came out to inspect things, they all had mounts in a matter of moments. Harry set his broom down, sure he would not need it, and that he would be able to find it again when it was all over, not that he was all that concerned with it now. Mounting the last Thestral he announced their destination, and gave a slight kick to his mount. Almost as one. The Thestrals all spread the great black reptilian wings and with startled screams from the girls, they were off. As they rose above the canopy of trees, Harry had only one single thought. I'm coming, Sirius. Minerva. Madame Pomper shouted in abject astonishment when she arrived in the defense classroom. She had been told she needed to come quickly by Ginny Weasley, who had responded to her older brother's plea for help. McGonagall was lying on her back in the middle of the room, her wand still clutched in her hands. Enaverate the matron said, brandishing her wand, but the deputy headmistress did not stir. Pomfrey ran a few diagnostic spells over her patient. Madam Pomfrey, there are more people in here, including Umbridge Ginny said, having gone to inspect the open office. She can wait. Pomfrey said and then under her breath, stupid hag. She performed a few quick spells and tried again to revive her patient. McGonagall gave a soft moan, and very slowly opened her eyes. Poppy. Minnie, what the devil happened? Umbridge crucioed me. Merlin's underpants. Jenny shrieked. Poppy, I need to speak to Severus. We have to find Albus. Something terrible has happened. Please like and subscribe.